Good morning, everyone. Uh, today, we will be finishing graphing square roots and cube roots, and we will mostly be talking about domain and range. So last class period, uh, we, we brought up the parent function y equals square root of x. And we talked about how this point down here, we call the uh, vertex. And we made a table of values to find our points. Um, if this is not stretched or compressed, it actually follows this pattern. Um, so it always goes to the right one, up one. And then it goes one, two, three, up one. Notice it went over one, up one, up three, one plus three is four, one plus one is two from here. So that kind of can help us. Um, it's something you probably will forget. So it's not something I would memorize, but it is something that might help us when we're trying to figure out points. So like if I move the vertex over one, then I know I need to plug in a point that's one after that, and then the one that's four after that, okay? We then talked about the cubic function. Remember, cubics can go both on uh, x positive and x negative. And it also goes right one up one, which it also goes left one down one from the vertex. And then it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven up one. from this point, or you could say eight, two from that point, uh, either one. Um, and then to get from here to here, I'd also go seven, one. Okay, so those are our parent functions. We have the square root function. We have the cubic function. Notice cubic is sym symmetrical on each side of that vertex. We talked about how to describe transformations. They're the same as a quadratic. I'll let you read through that again yourself. Um, one thing is, if you have a number with the X, like right here, then that is when it shifts it left and right. So you should think left and right when C is with the X and when the C a number is outside of the parentheses, you should be thinking up and down. That's called a vertical shift. So what did we do? Um, we had a plus two, so it took our quadratic and shifted it two. Notice the vertex is now at negative two zero. And then we went over one, up one, and then over one, two, three, up one, like we said. Okay. Um, if you put a negative, see, as soon as you start changing, then you can't follow that pattern anymore. So I don't really believe in memorizing over one, up one, over three, up, whatever it was. Um, but when you put a negative, it reflects it over the x-axis, flips it over. We then did the cubic function. The plus two shifted it two to the left. The three shifted it three up. So we want two over, three up. That's our vertex. And then everything else looked the same, up one over one, and so on. The three stretched it. And so now, I know we kind of went through that fast, but there's another video out there that you could watch me go through all that with you. But now we're going to talk about mostly domain range. So dividing by zero is undefined. And this is very important for a denominator. So you can never divide by zero. And then, um, I don't necessarily agree with this statement, but if you take the square root of a number that's negative in the real number system, then that doesn't make sense. So in the real number system, you would say does not exist or not more, probably better would be not real, okay? We can't graph those. 
Okay, unless we're talking about the complex number system. So um, remember, if you have the parent function, x needs to be bigger than or equal to zero because you could take the square root of zero. This also applies to fractional exponents. Remember x to the one half is the same thing as the square root, the square root of x. Those are the same thing. Remember there's an exponent of one here. That's the uh, index of two. You move the index underneath. So these are the same thing. So make sure you watch that. So what is the domain here? This has been shifted five to the right. Okay, so this one is shifted five to the right. And we just said that if you have the square root function, the domain is always bigger than or equal to zero. So if I shift it five to the right, then I need to shift that number five up. So I would say that X needs to be bigger than or equal to five for the domain. Okay. Now the range, and we'll talk about the range, uh, but the range, this is still gonna be on the X axis. So it's still gonna be Y is bigger than or equal to zero. So let's think about that. If I plug in four, four minus five is a negative number. You can't do that. I'm talking about domain. If I plug in five, that is okay. Five minus five is zero. Square root of zero is zero. Six is okay. Seven's okay. Eight's okay. But anything less than five is not okay. That's why our domain is X is bigger than or equal to, and I meant to write five. X is bigger than or equal to five because you shifted it five to the right. Now the numbers you get back, the smallest number you could get back, the square root of five minus five, zero, the square root of zero is still zero. So the smallest number you could get back for the Y is still zero. All right, this one was shifted three to the left. So what does that do to the domain, the parent function? Well, you're gonna have to subtract three from there. So zero minus three is negative three. So my domain is gonna be X is less than or equal to, I'm sorry, X is bigger than or equal to negative three. If I plug negative three in here, negative three plus three is zero, square root of zero is okay. That's zero. Um, any number, negative two works, negative one works, zero works, anything bigger than negative three. If I go less than negative three, like negative four, I get a negative number, negative four plus three is negative one, and you can't do that. Okay, the range, the range is still, the smallest number you'll get back, negative three plus three, zero, square root of zero, zero, so the range, it still, it spits out numbers bigger than zero or equal, okay? Now here's where it gets confusing because you can't really talk about shifting left and right. And another way I could have shown this is you could have set X plus three equal to zero and then solve for X, you get negative three, set X minus five equals zero, solve for X, you get five. And so we could do the same thing there. Uh, 2x plus 3 equals 0. So I would solve for x minus 3 on both sides. Divide by 2. That's like negative 3 halves. Or negative 1.5, same thing. And so when I write my domain, I'm going to say all the numbers bigger than negative 3 halves. And of course, the, uh, if I plug in negative three halves, 
I still get zero. Square root of zero is zero. The smallest number I could get back is still zero. And then this one, remember anything to the one half, that's the same thing as the square root of x minus four. If I set this equal to zero, what number minus four is zero? That'd be four. So it's all the numbers bigger than four for the domain. And for the range, it's gonna be y is bigger than or equal to zero. Now you may be thinking, is the range always going to be y is bigger than or equal to zero? And no, if I start moving this up, like if I had put a plus one here, then the range is going to be uh, one and up. If I put a plus two, it's going to be two and up. And so you got to pay attention. We're not shifting up and down. So that's why the range is still bigger than or equal to zero. We're going to do a few practices. Let's see. First, what is going on with this graph? Well, the negative, what does the negative do? That reflects it over the x axis. All right. What does the two do? The two stretches. Okay, that stretches it. Um, another word for that in our notes. Yeah, that's the word that we'll use is uh, vertically stretched. And then what does the three do? Uh, anything inside the radical with a number that's not in front of the X, but this is gonna shift it three to the right. All right, so let's try to graph this thing. My first number, the domain, we just talked about that. The domain, um, the smallest number I could put in here without making this go negative is three. So I'm gonna put X is bigger than or equal to three. Right. And let's think, if I plug three in here, I don't, I don't know why we don't have a table here, but tables are nice. If I plug three in there, Three minus three is zero. Square root of zero is zero. Zero times negative two is zero. And so I get zero. Right here. All right. Now, when you're doing with the square root function, a trick is you can always plug in the next number. So the next number after three is four. Usually, I shouldn't say always. Uh, four minus three is one. Square root of one is one. One times negative two is negative two. So I have four, negative two. Okay. So we plugged in four. Four minus three is one. The next perfect square after one is four. How does this equal four? That's when x is seven, seven minus three is four. So if I plug seven in, seven minus three is four, square root of four is two, negative two times two is negative four. One, two, three, four. The next perfect square after one, four, there's zero, one, four, and nine, is 16. 
how do I make this 16? It's when X is 19. Um, it's not going to fit. So we'll just stop here. So my graph's going to go here. It looks something like that. Okay, so things I forgot to fill in. What's my vertex? Where does this graph start? It starts at 3, 0. What's my x-intercept? Looks like 3, 0. Where will this cross the y? Never. And what's the range? We have been saying range is always bigger than or equal to zero because it usually goes this way. Because it's going this way, the biggest number y could be is zero. So we're gonna say y is less than or equal to zero. And we're done. All right, let's talk about this graph. Let's try to do it without graphing first. Okay, so what is my vertex gonna be? So the parent function, the vertex is usually zero, zero. The four shifts at four up. So my new vertex is gonna be zero, four. So I'll do the same thing. The four shifts at four up. All right, so my vertex is gonna be right here. That's also, um, and then from here, it's gonna go something like that. So my x-intercept, um, now if this was reflected, then it would go like this and it would eventually cross the x-axis. But because this number is positive, it's gonna go up. So it is never gonna touch the x-axis. So there is no x-intercept. The y-intercept, we can see is four, zero. Remember, it's gonna look like this. The domain is gonna be all numbers bigger than zero to the left and right. Because square root of zero is still zero. But if you plug zero in, Square root of zero, zero, zero plus four is four. The smallest number this will spit back is four. So that's why my range is y is bigger than or equal to four. Let's go ahead and graph this. Um, it's up one over one. And I'll do my table. Um, square root of one. Square root of one is one. One plus four is five. That's why I did one five. The next perfect square is four. Square root of four is two. Two plus four is six. Now I got four, six. In my notes, I said you could just remember go up one over three. And then the next one after that is next perfect square would be nine. Square root of nine is three. Three plus four is seven. Nine, seven. And then no more is going to fit on this graph. So I will start at the vertex, connect the dots with the nice smooth curve put an arrow to tell the person I ran out of room, but it goes forever, okay? All right, let's do another one. Let's see, what is going on here? The two, what does the two do? The two is inside the radical. That shifts it left and right. Because it's a plus two, it shifts it to the left two. Okay, the negative five is on the outside. That shifts it up and down. Negative five shifts it down.
So my vertex is usually at zero, zero, but I need to go two units to the right and five down. So right about there. That is my new vertex. Let's confirm. This point is two. Oh boy, I'm glad I'm checking my work. Shifts two to the left, I went two to the right. So ignore that point. We need to go two to the left, five down. We need to actually go there. Okay. So when I plug in negative two, negative two plus two is zero. Square root of zero is zero. Zero minus five is negative five. So again, ignore this point. We're not gonna use this point. So yes, my vertex is negative two, five. You might have a question where they just ask you for the vertex and you would just say opposite of this, same as this. Now what's the domain gonna do? What number makes this zero? Negative two. Negative two plus two is zero. So the smallest x you could plug in is negative two. That means my domain has to be all numbers bigger than negative two or equal to. This, because it's not reflected over the x-axis, it's positive out here, it's gonna go up. So the range is gonna be negative five and up. So I could go ahead and fill in the range. Y is always going to be bigger than or equal to negative five. All right. Well, let's keep going. Um, the next perfect square after zero is one. How do I make this one? That would be when X is negative one. Negative one plus two is one. Square root of one, one. One minus five, negative four. Negative one, negative four. Or you could just remember up one over one. The next perfect square after one is, um, is four. Now how do I make this four is when X is two. Two plus two is four. Two plus two is four. Square root of four is two. Two minus five is negative three. Or you may remember it's up one over three. And then the next perfect square, and I just keep going until I can't go anymore. The next perfect square after four is nine. So that'd be X is seven, seven plus two is nine. Seven plus two is nine. Square root of nine is three, three minus five, negative two. See how the gap's getting larger? Like there's no way another one's gonna fit. So we'll go ahead and draw our graph. Starts here at the vertex. And it goes up forever. Now, how do you find the X and Y intercept? Well, to find the X intercept, that's when Y is zero. To find the Y intercept, that's when x is zero. So I could do that real fast, x-intercept. If I'm gonna find the x-intercept, that means y is zero. So I set this equal to zero. I add five to both sides. I square both sides to get rid of that square. And technically I'm solving what's called a radical equation and I haven't shown you how to do this yet. So if you do not understand what I'm doing here, it's okay. And then from there I would subtract two, so I get 23. What does that mean? That means that if you continue this up, when I plug 23 in, that's when I finally get zero. Let's check. 23 plus two is 25. Square root of 25 is five. Five minus five is zero. So there's another point. 23 
23, 0. Okay. And then to find the y-intercept, I would plug in 0 for the x. Well, let's do that. So that'd be square root of two minus five. That's gonna be irrational. So it's gonna be a number that goes on and on and on forever. So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna leave it a square root of two minus five. So um, we set the x-intercept is at 23, zero. The y-intercept is gonna be at zero, square root of two minus five. I type square root of two minus five with my calculator. Let's see what I get. Negative 3.5. And if I look at this, negative 3.58578643848 forever, um, it, it looks like negative 3.5-ish. And it is negative 3.5-ish, but not exactly negative 3.5. Exact is square root of two minus five. All right, let's talk about the cubic function. Uh, what happened here? Remember, with the cubic, it will continue here also. So here's something that's interesting. Um, the domain, because it, it's going to always go in this direction and then this direction, the domain is all real numbers. And guess what? The range, because it's going to go up and then it's also going to go down, it's also all real numbers. So that's nice. So if you have a cubic, to my knowledge, I can't think of one counterexample, the domain and range is always all real numbers. Um, you start putting fractions and stuff in there, it changes, but for the basic ones, it will always be. What's going on here? The four. The four shifts it four units to the left because it's inside that does left and right. The negative one shifts it one down. I guess I should just put one, not negative one, shifts one unit down. Remember, the parent function also starts at zero, zero, but we're gonna go four to the right, one, two, three, four, and then one down. So here's where our vertex is gonna be. At four, negative one. Did the same thing this last problem. Plus four. Remember, if it's plus four, and this is a common mistake, I did it on purpose. If this is a plus four, that actually shifts it to the left. Negative one shifts it down still. So ignore this point again. We'll blame daylight savings time. Uh, but we really need to go four, one here. Let's check. Negative four plus four is zero. Cube root of zero, zero, zero minus one is negative one. So whatever I do on this side, I can do on this side. The next point's always gonna be one over. We'll make a table. I'll put it way over here this time. So the perfect cubes, the next perfect cube just after uh, zero is one. How do you make this one? That's when X is negative three. Negative three plus four is one. So negative three plus four is one. Cube root of one is one because one times one times one is one. One minus one is zero. So I get negative three, zero. Remember if I fill that in, I can fill this in. It's symmetrical. The next point, 
the next perfect square after, I'm sorry, perfect cubed after one is two times two times two is eight. How do I make this eight? This one X is four. So I'm gonna plug in four. Four plus four is eight. What times what times what is eight? Two times two times two is eight. Two minus one is one. So I get four one. One, two, three, four, one. And remember also it's always one, seven. <laughs> if I go one, seven this way, I need to go one, seven this way. One, two, three, four, five, six, not gonna fit. Okay. But I should probably at least graph it. Hold on. Uh, one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, but it's going to curve down this way. And in front of the vertex, it's going to curve up. I know it's kind of hard to see. And so what is my x-intercept? My x-intercept, we already knew, it's negative 3, 0. We have that on our table. What's my y-intercept? Uh, kind of hard to see. Remember, I need to plug zero in here to find the y-intercept. So I plug in zero for x. I don't know. I wrote down the same thing again. Let's try again. Plug in zero for X. I was worried I was going to write down the same thing again. Uh, you don't need two of these. Uh, zero plus four is four. Cube root of four. Uh, there, there is no cube root of four unless you get a uh, decimal. So we'll leave that as cube root of four. Minus one. And so my range, my, not my range, my y-intercept is going to be zero, cube root of four, minus one. And if I type that in my calculator, cube root of four minus one, I get 0.58-ish, 0 0.58740102. It's irrational. It's going to go forever. And that looks to be 0.5-ish. Okay. So what did we learn today? We learned about domain and range. We learned that in a square with the index of two, um, you just domain and range is gonna is gonna change depending on the vertex. In a cubic function, or I should say a cubed root function, uh, domain and range should be all real numbers most of the time. So that's all I have for today. Thanks for coming. I will post this. Have a good day. Bye-bye.